Hello, my name's Russell Arnott. I'm a researcher here at the University of Bath within the WEIR unit. And WEIR stands for Water, Environment and Infrastructure Resilience. It's a small department within civil engineering where basically anyone who studies water gets put. So within that, we've got people who model catchment areas, we've got people who are looking at flood defences and coastal resilience, and there's me, who's basically the university plankton guy. So I research plankton, which are the tiny little things that float around in the sea. So there's two different types of plankton. There's phytoplankton, which are the plants, and there's the zooplankton, which are the animals. So most people know about zooplankton because that's what whales eat, and plankton in SpongeBob, he happens to be a zooplankton. And these things eat on the phytoplankton, which is what I study. Now, loads of people are like, oh, phytoplankton, oh, they're just green floaty things in the sea, aren't they quite boring or whatever? Actually, really interesting and really important. So first of all, Phytoplankton produce 80% of the oxygen that keeps us alive. So there's a lot of focus on how important forests are for our climate and keeping us alive, but in fact the oceans provide 80% of the oxygen. So why else are phytoplankton important? Well, if we think about a food chain, you've got sun goes in, you've got your phytoplankton, they get eaten by the zooplankton, zooplankton get eaten by fish, and then fish get eaten by us. So if you like eating fish and chips, then Phytoplankton are at the basis of most marine food chains. So phytoplankton are also important because they're plants. And what all plants do is take carbon dioxide out of the air, turn it into their structure and their sugars. But the best thing about phytoplankton is when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean and they take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and lock it in deep ocean sediments. So potentially, if we could harness the power of phytoplankton, we could reduce some of the effects that we're seeing from anthropogenic climate change. So not all plankton are good. Some plankton are bad. There's about 200 out of the million or so species of phytoplankton that produce toxins. And these produce these big blooms called harmful algal blooms or HABs. Uh, sometimes we call them red tides because they literally turn the water bright red. And these are a type of plankton that give off this toxin that goes out into the water and they produce this toxin to stop other things from grazing. Uh, so it kind of helps them get a competitive edge. Now the problem is, if you were to go swimming in this water while this bloom was happening, you would get like an itch all over your skin and if you were to swallow some of that water, you'd get uh, diarrhea and vomiting. It's not gonna be fun. But the uh, real problem is when these toxins wash into a place where there's a fishery, aquaculture, or mussel beds or oyster beds, and these things are able to feed on this toxic plankton, and that allows that toxin to build up into higher and higher concentrations as we go up through the food chain. And there's certain situations where people have been known to, just by, just by eating a single mussel or a single oyster, have actually been paralyzed for life with a thing called um, paralytic shellfish poisoning. And in extreme cases, this toxin can actually kill people. Now the bad news is that because of global warming, these harmful algal blooms are actually happening with a higher severity and a higher frequency. They're so bad, in fact, that even Donald Trump has pigeonholed extra money to research why they're happening, because all around the coast of Florida and in the Great Lakes last summer, they had a real problem with harmful algal blooms. So I have here in my hands some 3D printed models from my favorite group of phytoplankton, which are the dinoflagellates. The key word in the middle of that is flagella. And that is basically a science word that means a whip, because all of these species have a little whip-like structure or a little tutu that they can flap. And that basically helps them swim around the water column and get themselves into that really good position to get the light or to go down and get the nutrients. They're also really cool because a lot of these species are kind of like halfway between a plant and an animal. And they actually need to eat other phytoplankton cells in order to survive. So this thing here is called dinophysis. And this is amazing because when this is kind of produced, it can't photosynthesize. And that's what all plants do. So what this has to do is eat another phytoplankton cell and then it steals its chloroplasts and then it can photosynthesize, which I think is pretty amazing. But now this one here, is called Carinia, and this does something really cool. 
So Karenia is from a little group of phytoplankton that can actually glow. So we call this bioluminescence because it's light that's given off by life. I have here in my hands some chemoluminescent chemicals which work in very much the same way. Now the idea behind both of these reactions is they produce light without producing any heat. So if we could bring the lights down slightly, I'm going to start off this chemoluminescent reaction and you can see here that really quickly just when this chemical reaction happens we get this really really strong blue light and that's the same thing that Karenia does it gives off this bright blue bioluminescence and the reason behind this is that if something is trying to eat it it moves towards Karenia and produces a turbulent kind of pressure wave and Karenia detects this and all of a sudden glows bright blue Another animal passing will see this blue flash and be attracted to it. It'll come over. It won't be interested in eating Karenia, but it will be interested in eating the animal that's trying to eat Karenia. So it's a little bit like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So here at the University of Bath, I'm researching the link between phytoplankton and how turbulent a water environment is. Now, we're used to kind of thinking of turbulence as being, for a human, it's like stormy or when we're in an aeroplane and we're being moved up and down or something like that. But when you're a plankton, a tiny little thing floating around in the water, that turbulence can have a profound impact on the kind of conditions that you're exposed to. For example, if you're a species that's quite heavy and in nice calm conditions, you would sink out and you get away from the light at the top, which means you wouldn't do very well. But if it's quite a mixed environment, it's quite turbulent, then you are going to be mixed higher and lower and you're going to be moving up and down throughout that water column and you're going to be getting a higher net light than if it was calm and you were just sinking out. Similarly, if you're a type of species that's got a little gas bubble inside you and you're going to be positively buoyant and you're going to be floating up. So if it's nice and calm, then you are going to get a competitive edge and going to be able to get up to that photic layer where the light is and grow. But again, if it's turbulent, then you're going to be mixed around throughout the whole depth and you're actually going to get less light. So depending on the kind of species you are, whether you're positive or negatively buoyant, how turbulent it is or how mixed it is has a profound impact on how well you do in that environment. Now, the other weird thing about plankton is they come in all kinds of sizes and shapes. And I'm actually trying to figure out how the size and shape of different phytoplankton cells affects how they kind of interact within that turbulent environment. For example, why bother growing extra spikes or being a ball shape or a stick shape or something like that if it isn't going to give you some kind of competitive advantage? Some plankton are funny shapes to stop them getting eaten by other things, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to figure out that actually the shape of plankton affects how well they do in different types of turbulent environments. So I've been going over to Sweden to the University of Umeå, which is right at the top. It's the northernmost city in Sweden. And I've been going there and using some of their facilities in the marine station there. They've got these massive mesocosms, which are basically giant five meter high tanks. Each one holds about two tons of water. And within that, I can set up and tweak the environment exactly how I want it. So I filled it up with a natural phytoplankton population from offshore. And in the different tanks, I've set up different turbulent environments. Some are nice and calm, some are quite mixed, and I'm looking at how the phytoplankton respond to these different environments. So it's quite cool. So I, as well as measuring the physics of the water, I've been measuring the chemistry and also the biology. So I've been looking at the primary production and the different species. And for that, I've been taking water samples at different depths and using this really cool machine called a flow cam. And it's basically a flow cytometer, so it measures particles, it's a microscope, and it's a camera all in one unit. So I can get my plankton sample, pour it in the top, and every time a plankton cell cuts a laser, it takes a photograph. And so within 10 minutes, I can photograph over 6,000 individual plankton cells. I can record a digital image of each one of those, and I can analyze those with 30 different statistics for each cell, which is pretty awesome. If I was doing it manually, I'd be able to count maybe 300 cells in an hour and a half. So using this awesome piece of kit, I've been able to photograph over 400,000 plankton cells, which has given me quite a lot of data to look at. So I'll be honest, I came from a physics background, and when I 
started researching plankton, I didn't really realise how cool they were. And I think everyone in my office is getting a bit tired of me turning around and being like, did you know that plankton can do this? Honestly, I think they're absolutely amazing. And every week I learn a new thing about them that completely and utterly astounds me, which is kind of why I study them.